Hello and welcome to On The Ledge podcast with your host, Jane Perrone. Planty to the core. In this week's show, I am joined by Peter Boyce, Aroid researcher and the honorary president of the newly formed European Aroid Society. We talk about the new society, developments in the world of Aroids, both horticultural and scientific, why we all get very confused about Aroid leaf shape and a fascinating vanilla scented Aroid that you've probably never heard of. Plus, I answer a question about potting plants with no drainage hole. Ooh, daring. Hello, and thank you for joining me for the final episode before my summer break. If you are listening to the show at some point in the future, then hopefully you can just skip on to the next episode. But if you are here with me in July 2021, then the next episode will be out on September the 10th. If this is sending you into paroxysms of fear, then I have a few suggestions. I have done 190 odd episodes of the show, so it may be you've missed an episode or you want to go back and listen again. There's a thematic list of episodes which I will share in the show notes. At the bottom of that page, there's also a list of other podcasts I've appeared on and there's well, at least 12 or 15 of those. So there's plenty of material to be going on with. And I'll be posting some links on social media over the coming weeks of other talks and things that you might be interested in having a look at to fill that OTL shaped hole in your life. Thank you to everybody who responded to last week's episode uh, about mental health with Amy March from Perky Plants. A really great response from many people who found the episode helpful, found that the themes resonated in their own lives and were nodding along as we talked about the challenges of plant overwhelm, depression and more. I had a message from someone we'll call M who felt like that episode was talking directly to them. And they write, I never realised that situation could be plausible or even understandable to someone. Em's somebody who suffers from chronic depression and anxiety and finds it difficult to function in life. And Em writes, sometimes my passion for houseplants feels like a shallow hyperfixation. After all, how can someone spend hours caring for their plants but not be able to brush their hair? I must be faking or lazy or the depression is just all in my imagination, even though I've been formally diagnosed for years now. These thoughts come during times when I'm feeling resentful towards myself and frustrated at how my life is going. But I'm beyond grateful that humanity has come up with the activity of plant cultivation because otherwise I would feel utterly lost. And M goes on to describe a situation where a panic attack managed to be stopped in its tracks by plants. And I just wanted to share this with you in case it's a useful technique for anybody. There's a technique for dealing with anxiety where you focus on your surroundings and describe them to yourself. It's fairly well established and you may have heard about it. But Em decided to bring their plants into this. And Em writes, I was, of course, surrounded by my plants and I went round to each one saying out loud to myself everything I knew about the species, but also more importantly, the story behind that individual plant since it came into my care. I've never calmed down so fast before and I hope other plant owners who struggle like I do can find some benefit in this technique. So there you go. That's a, a great one to try for anxiety. And thank you to Em for getting in touch and telling me about that. I know it's sometimes not easy to share, but I know that everyone, but this is how we help each other out. And Lena got in touch about lots of different things, including her desire for everyone to join plant societies, which I think I would definitely concur with. Lena's been collecting orchids for about 15 years and found that their collection fluctuated depending on how they felt. I think we can probably all sympathise with that. But Lena writes, combined with social media glam post pressure, addictive personality and depression has, has made me feeling disgusted with myself at points where I just kept pressing by and saying, this is the last one, even though I knew this will have to come out of the overdraft or a credit card. Thanks for bringing attention to this issue. 
This is a theme that really resonates with lots of us, doesn't it? So let's keep talking about it, discussing it, bringing it to the fore and normalising, checking on each other in a caring way, recognising both the pluses and the less positive bits of the houseplant hobby. Let's crack on with this week's interview, which comes from Peter Boyce. Peter is a plant taxonomist and biologist, and he's based in Sarawak, the Malaysian state that takes up the northwest corner of Borneo. And in partnership with his wife, Wong Sin Yang, he researches aroids. He's also taken up the role of honorary president of the newly formed European Aroid Society. So in this interview, we go from the basics, what's an aroid, we find out a bit more about the EAS and its aims, cover some top tips for helping climbing aroids to secure themselves, and a lot more. Do check out the show notes for this one, loads of great images and information to go with the interview as you listen. I'm Peter Boyce, I'm a plant taxonomist and biologist working in uh, Southeast Asia, based in Sarawak which is on the northwest corner of the island of Borneo. And it's one of two bits of Malaysia that make up the island of Borneo together with Brunei and the bulk of the island is Indonesian Borneo, uh, Kalimantan. And I run a tissue culture lab <coughs> doing plantation crops, but I'm also a researcher for tropical aeroids, tropical aeraceae, so the Syngonian philodendron family. It's great to have you on the show. Can you just fill us in on what classifies a plant as an aroid? From the perspective of people's knowledge of house plants, it's things like peace lilies, apifilum, anthuriums, the, the, the so-called tail flowers, um, philodendrons, monstrous, and, uh, and so on. And from a biological standpoint, what defines a family is having a, a finger-like structure on which the flowers are arranged um, surrounded by a, a, a color, usually colourful leaf-like structure, which is a, termed a, a, a spathe. It's like a, 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 a bract surrounding this finger of flowers. They're the two defining characters that are visible easily. And the third character from the biological point is that individual flowers on this finger-like structure don't have a little bract underneath them. Now, that sounds incredibly trivial. But if you start pulling apart flowers of things like Buddleia or uh, uh, Stephanotis, which had their flowers in clusters, every flower's got a little, a little structure at the base, like a tiny green leaf, which is called a bract or a bracteole, to be really accurate. Arrows lack those, and that's unique in the plant kingdom. There is a certain section of these arrows that have become of huge interest to houseplant collectors of late. I think those of us with longer memories will probably realise this isn't the first time that this has happened. But what is it about aroids that you think makes them, or this particular segment of aroids that makes them good houseplants and, and the subject of such feverish excitement? The feverish excitement, I think, is the fact that the um, one of the most popular groups now are things like philodendrons and monstra. And with monstra, the, the, the craze at the moment is how many holes has the leaf got? You, know, they, you end up with these remarkably, these remarkable, almost Belgian lace leaves, which I think many people find very beguiling. With philodendron, it's often the new leaf colour is very different to the mature leaves. So as the plant grows, you've got this constant flush of bright pink or bright green or, or yellow green leaves, which then age to variously variegated leaves. So that's that's where a lot of the passion's from. What makes them good house plants is a slightly more Awkward, not an awkward is the wrong word, slightly more problematic. Monstro, you know, the Swiss cheese plant, is a monumental climber in the wild. It would climb to 20 metres up a large tropical tree, which if you think about winter cells in, in European cities, is, is really not immediately an obvious choice. But because they perforate their leaves early on and they are kept manageable by tripping, uh, trimming them back, people think they are manageable houseplants, and indeed they are manageable houseplants, but if you look at them from the perspective of what they do in the forest, they are the most unlikely houseplants you could imagine. These are you know, colossal climates, and yet because they are amenable to being chopped back and kept on windowsills, they, and, and by and large are pretty tough things, the ones that are most popular. They are in many ways of the ideal houseplant, and different bark here, you know, the, the, the dum cane has been a popular houseplant for, for 50 years. Um, a plant in the wild that grows in 
tropical swampy areas. So there's a paradox. On the one hand, if you look at them from a cold perspective of what they do in the wild, they're the most unlikely plants for houses. And yet, because they're easy growing and they're attractive and they have variegated leaves and perforated leaves, party coloured growths, they've become enormously popular, which is you know, quite exciting, actually. I wondered about that, how you feel about this huge surge of interest in aroids. I mean, it's exciting. Is it also worrying in that it's leading to plants being taken from the wild, particularly where you are? Well, no, that, there's, there's, a, there's an interesting, another interesting paradox in there, actually. Although there's a huge amount of, of noise, justifiable, about the removal of industrial quantities of plants from the wild, the, root, the truth of the matter is the, the, the large percentage of the greatest, most popular groups are already in cultivation. It's just that people have cottoned on to the idea that variegated forms of philodendron biliitii or, or preposterously perforated leaf forms of monstera adansonii or monstera obliqua are marketable. A lot of these plants have been in cultivation, you know, tucked away in the backs of nurseries for, for decades. And yet suddenly this balloon has come up whereby they're suddenly popular. And the more outlandish the colour forms or the more outlandish the amount of holes in the leaves, the more dollars the plants attract. So that part of it doesn't worry me. I mean, I, I think it's not like the price is being paid are, 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 frankly, are, are ridiculous, but that's, that's you know, fine. That's, the, that's market forces. With regard to stripping out from the wild to supply an international market, with probably the exception of Alocasia, that isn't such a big issue as everyone seems to think. The one genus that concerns me, especially for this part of the world, is Alocasia. That's where my concerns are, um, partly because a lot of them occur in very small areas in the wild, and partly because some of the removal rates are really very disturbingly, almost on an industrial scale. So... Um, I'm 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 between two between two poles on this. A lot of the big profit generating plants have been in cultivation many many years. It's just suddenly people have woken up to the fact. Oh, that's actually quite a special plant. Can we talk a little bit about the Raphidophora genus, the one species that seems to be have broken through in terms of the global houseplant market is what's called tetrasperma. And I say that because I've seen various discussions about this species and whether it is this species and variations. Can you, can you shed any light on that as a taxonomist? I've given up commenting on these discussions <laughs> because basically Raphidophora tetrasperma is an incredibly well-defined species. It, it doesn't grow in Borneo. It's a peninsular Malaysia species. And it gets into the far south of Thailand, below the Isthmus of Kra. And in the wild, it's usually, but not always, associated with cast limestone. And there are populations that aren't on cast. And the big problem is that most people growing climbing aroids make two big mistakes. One is they don't give them a suitable climbing surface. They try to pin them to bamboo sticks with twist ties and things. And the other thing they don't give them is enough light. Now, rapid offer in the wild um, go through various growth phases. And there's a terrestrial phase where the plant in the forest is looking for climbing surfaces. And I won't get into all the technical words for this, but there's a, they, they seek dark areas, the, the, these long, whippy shoots, uh, and to, in order to begin to climb, to go up into the light, to go up into the canopy, to flower, or onto the rock surface, in the case of tetrasperma. And the thing is, the leaves on these long, whippy shoots are... Very, very different in appearance to the leaves that the same shoots begin to produce once they begin to climb. And those same shoots will produce yet different leaves again once the, the shoot apex gets into an area with good light. So a lot of what you see on the on the web where people say this is tetrasperma but it hasn't got holes or this is tetrasperma but it's only got divisions and no perforations and then I'll show tetrasperma with holes in the leaves and say, well, this isn't tetrasperma, this is pertusa, are all tetrasperma. And then there's this, there's this thing about going about, about how the plants are modified because of tissue culture. This is, this is frankly, actually quite nonsense. All that's happening is that the, the various growers who are posting their individual plants on are not comparing the conditions they grow their plant in with the conditions another grower who posts his or her plants on are growing under. We have five clones of tetrasperma on the nursery, 
one, um, two from Kelantan, one from Central Peninsula Malaysia, from Pahang, and one from Southern Thailand. And allowing for a little bit of variation, they're all very stable. Once the leaves get into the light, they get much bigger and they start to produce perforations. Until that point, the leaves remain rather small and only have sort of splits in the sides, that, but no holes and and no um, you know no sort of clinging tips of the individual shoot uh, individual leaf lobes. Further confusion is people are growing Raphidophora pertusa, which is a species from India and Sri Lanka. And I'm mixing the two up. You mentioned there about the incorrect ways of trying to support climbing aroids. Suboptimal, shall we? Suboptimal. Say. Okay, that's a good word. <laughs> what's the optimal way if you are sort of growing them in a houseplant situation? What's best practice? Totems are okay, but um, this business about keeping the totem wet is really a bit a bit pointless. As long as the the, the plant is misted semi-regularly the best thing to do is if it's not too big haul it into the bathroom and run the shower on it for a few moments just to to dampen the stems the roots of the climbing stems will very happily adhere to a a, a dry totem now the idea that the totem has got to be wet to enable the the roots to stick is 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 just fallacious it's just not true even better although this is starts to get a bit awkward if you're dealing with plants on windowsills is is a section of cork sort of cork wood you know, the orchid people grow on on slabs of cork. Um, getting some slender strips of cork, maybe attach them to a, a to a, a lightweight plastic uh, drainage pipe, like a, a one half inch plastic pipe. Because cork, because of all the fissures and so on, is um, ideal surface for, for climbing aroids. And, and cork is sustainably managed as well. Uh, it's not cheap, but you know, moss on totems is not sustainably managed by and large. So a, stri- a strip of cork or a piece of rug, although it's not very attractive if you, you know, you're looking at plants in, indoors, but a, a, a batten of rough wood. And this is what the Victorians used to do. The Victorians used to grow on battens of rough wood for a climbing orchids too. That works very well. Um, but a, a, a wigwam of bamboo sticks and lots of twisted ties, the plant will survive. It won't, it won't prosper. That's fascinating. And I'm, I'm loving the idea of the, the piece of rough wood. I mean, I, I guess, hopefully, if your aroid is growing well, it will be colonising the wood and uh, you might not end up seeing... So, uh, the, the woods is you're going to be looking at the leaves rather than looking at the piece of wood. Yeah, and it needs to be a reasonable length. Uh, you know, a six inch piece isn't going to work. It'll work for the first, you know, maybe the few, first few weeks. It needs to be a decent... I'm not, I'm not suggesting some huge sort of great big pole... But if you could manage three foot, you know, metre, then you could get some pretty decent growth and um, that would look very nice. Well, that is really good advice. It's, it's wonderful to have your input on that because I know lots of listeners ask questions about moss poles and all these different issues. So that's really useful. Now, the, the EAS, the European Aroid Society, this newly formed society for aroid fans, what do you think the society is going to bring to the aroid community? Presumably there's been a great demand in Europe for some kind of community set up around this subject. Yes. I mean, there, there's always been a core of growers in Europe, you know, people like who are a lot, many of which will be involved with the society you know, directly already, people like David Sherbrooke in Lyon and Emily and uh, Niels Vieses in, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, Emily in Belgium. And then uh, Genevieve Ferry in Nancy, and they've always been there. And there's always been a kind of a core of keen. Uh, I mean, they're, they're all professional growers um, or very keen amateurs in the case of them and the and, uh, and Niels. And then there's always been a core of kind of keen growers. What's happened? To, and it's and it's, it's tempting to link it to this current business with COVID, but there has definitely been a huge upsurge in aroid interests, which does seem to be linked to a longer period where people have been confined to home. Now, I'm not, I'm not correlating those two at all, but you know, the, the, it does look pretty convincing. So there's, this, there's a very, very active aroid set in Europe now, I mean, a few thousands of people. And the society partly came about to, to um, enable them to communicate. 
um, directly and indirectly, directly through the, the, the Society website and the Society Facebook, and a little bit less so through Instagram and Twitter, and and um, indirectly through the Society newsletter, which is the first issue has just been has just been published. Now, the newsletter is unavowedly non-scientific by definition. That's that's the plan at the moment. The Society at some point might start producing a scientific journal, but at the moment it's all about allowing keen growers, amateur growers, professional growers, keen hobbyists, um, houseplant enthusiasts to communicate about the plants they like. And there was a lack of that facility in Europe, and no doubt about it. It's going to be a really great opportunity for people to get something in the way of expert advice because I think that's one of the problems in the world of social media there's a lot of people out there talking about aroids not all with uh, enough knowledge to be speaking with authority as it if I could say that yeah no I I think that's incredibly polite actually there's a lot of um, a lot of nonsense spoken actually and some of it is quite misleading and then new growers you know they call themselves newbies get very disappointed because they spend quite a bit of money on a plant and they're told some completely unreliable his information, which a lot of people repeat. It's like the ice cube and orchids <laughs> business. It's busy about growing orchids. You know, war. It's in that league. It's not quite that bad, but it's in that league. So, no, great. It's, there's, they've got somewhere to key into now where they know there's someone like David or, or Neil who are really good, competent growers and, and who can say, hey, well, no, I wouldn't do it that way. Maybe try this. So it's great. Yeah, it's terrific. I guess also the, the wonderful thing about aroids is that they are uh, the ones that are grown as houseplants are often very forgiving. So. Absolutely, especially with adlenine. Adlenine was different bark is a lot of the a lot of the, the certainly the philodendron hybrids. They're extraordinarily forgiving plants, actually, far more so than say cactus or succulent or uh, dare I say windowsill orchids. Yes, indeed. be back with more from peter shortly after this break this episode is supported by berg wachter the experts on security products in your home whether you're looking for a quality padlock or a high-tech alarm system berg wachter keeps you and your family safe many of us got the gardening bug during lockdown if your garden's now filled with tools equipment and furniture it's time to think about making sure you're not a target for thieves keep garden tables and chairs barbecues and bikes secure with Berg Wachter's range of locking cables security chains and wall or ground mounted anchors and protect your shed or garage by investing in a quality padlock or combination locking bolt check out Berg Wachter's full range at berg.biz forward slash uk that's b-u-r-g dot biz forward slash uk Bergwächter, always the safe choice. What is coming along in the world of aroids that perhaps my listeners won't have come across yet, but is is on the way? What what's the sort of the hot topics that as um, as aroid experts, you and the board members are talking about? Horticulturally or scientific? Well, let's start with horticulturally. Right. Well, I think one of the most exciting things is the extraordinary diversity of aroid species that are coming into cultivation. Now, this may sort of start to edge into some slightly less uh, wonderful items regarding collecting plants in the wild. But nevertheless, there's no doubt now that there is probably more diversity of aroid species available now than any time in the past ever, including the big Edwardian Victorian phase, you know, phase for horticultural plants in in the UK and in, and in Western Europe. So the diversity available is it's astonishing, and um, and it's and it's increasing. I mean, uh, the number of anthuriums cultivation now is easily a few hundred, of which probably a good two thirds are you know, readily available in, in in terms of readily available in terms of buying them from semi-specialist growers rather than your local garden centre. But what's interesting is a lot of these new rare things that appear initially in specialist grower nurseries, they catch the eye of large wholesale garden centre suppliers. And then they start to get involved with mass propagation, mass production. And suddenly a thing that's incredibly rare and difficult to find now Three or four years down the line, it's on. You know, it's in. It's in. You know, uh, supermarket 
or not close to the market, but you know, decent garden centres are offering them for sale. That's very exciting. So the prices start to drop, and then people think, oh, I'll try that because it's three or four quid rather than, oh, I'm not going to do that, it's 150 pounds, can't afford that. So that, that filter through is very exciting. The fact that this huge diversity that's available now in specialist collections filters through into the more general and this has happened with cactus in the past as well. You know, ultra rare cacti get propagated, and suddenly a thing that was impossible to find for sale 10 years ago, you can pick it up in a garden center, not necessarily very cheaply, but at least availability. So that's that's I think the most exciting thing of all. And the, the, the society will be will be very part will be very much part of that because of the availability of information to say to people, well, this is something that's worth buying. If you see it for sale for a few euro or a few pounds pick it up because this is worth having and let's move on to scientifically i mean i know there's loads of work going on with various genera in terms of taxonomy what what's your sort of potted summary on that well well that's that's a, that's how many hours have i got well basically <laughs> there's, there's 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 well there's one interesting this probably will will be of absolutely no interest whatsoever to 99 percent of your listeners and that's not meant to sound patronizing but there's a new phylogeny coming out there's a new Taxon, there's a new taxonic framework coming out. I, I can't tell, talk about it in too much detail because it's it's not yet been you know it's not in the public domain. But um, a number of botanic gardens and, and specialist um, researchers and indeed specialist growers and and botanic gardens have been involved in the last few years with supplying leaf material for molecular analysis to create a new kind of framework for relationships. So we we, we understand more and more and more. About how things are related. Now, this might sound as dry as dust, um, but from, from from the point of view of the society, the society, although it is very much at the moment a grower's society, which is what it should be, the fact that we can plug into this information because some of the board members have, have been very actively involved with this big project is rather exciting. It, it puts the society's feet in two places. It puts the society's feet firmly in the on the side of the growers and the hobbyists ornamental uh, commercial nurseries, you know, people who are new to growing hours. But it also gives a link through for them, for those who are interested, into you know, what we understand about how these things are related. And, it, and it's, that's, that's very exciting that the society is involved with that. Um, although the society has come in after that project started, there are members of the board who have been very actively involved. So that's very nice. And there's also, we're beginning to get a lot more understanding about pollination biology now that again may not sound terribly interesting but it starts to open up vistas for well we know that these two things are very close related and we know their pollination is similar let's try some hybrids now i'm not a big fan of hybrids but many 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 people are and so that you know an example would be colocasia the taro and alocasia now they don't hybridize easily but there's now an intermediate genus, Lodicasia, which hybridizes with both. So then you start getting involved with, well, maybe we can get the best characteristics of two or three things that are hard to grow into a plant that's easy to grow. And then, and so that's, yeah, there's, that's the scientific side. It's, it fits into the horticultural side quite neatly, even though some of the science might seem to have used a terrapin and ivory tower. I think there is a lot of discussion about some of the sort of, uh, can I say, more blunt issues of taxonomy of of aroids on social media. And again, as we as we talked about with Raphidophora, um, oftentimes it's not entirely accurate. But you know, I see so many discussions about is this Monstra deliciosa large form, Bosigiana, and all these different things. So I think in a way, there is a there is a segment of the, the sort of hobby growers who will be delighted maybe to have some more clarity about um, taxonomy. Absolutely. And, and we have a very, and the, the nice thing with Monstra is that there's a very young, very capable and incredibly enthusiastic Costa Rican student about to begin a PhD on Monstra uh, who's been working on their master's degree. And so that is rather exciting. The, the fact that this this is this chap who's been working on on Monstra and with a big there's a big paper coming out soon, which will clarify some of these names and some of the names that they're being used are incorrectly applied to things that are actually undescribed, which is rather nice. So people will discover the thing they've got as as uh, you know. Uh, Borsigiana is in fact not Borsigiana at all. It's actually an undescribed species. I mean, to take an example. So yeah, there is there is interest out there. Yeah, that's exciting. 
Yeah, I think so. And I think that's that's part of perhaps part of the appeal of, of Aroids is that you've got things that are are variable and change over time. I mean, I think it's fascinating the way that the aroid leaves, you know, vary from the juvenile form to the adult form and in between and the amount of light. We still don't understand why that happens. You know. I think this is one of those things that does happen in nature. I mean, I'm thinking of ivy, heterohelix here in the UK, which when it gets to the top of a fence or a tree, the arborescent form of the leaves is very, very different from the juvenile form. That's so right. it does. It, it's, but I think we notice it so much more in our house plants. But there are plants which, I mean, people don't even recognise when they get to the adult form. I mean, I'm thinking of devil's ivy, of course, which is the classic one, which you very rarely see in the in the West in its... Um, you can never get it big enough. Yeah, the only place I've ever seen it is at Wisley, actually, where they have got a really big one going up a, a, a pillar. It grows on lampposts here. Right. It's, it's, somewhat, it's somewhat weedy in, in Sarawak, and it grows on lampposts. And on the top of the lampposts, it will indeed form these enormous split... Nor split leaves. That's right. But in a in a pot, it'll it'll you'll be hard pressed to get it big enough. Indeed. And I just want to go back to the very beginning of this interview when you were talking about uh, Monstera deliciosa growing up trees. I I would love it because I've never seen one growing um, in that n- natural situation. I've seen big ones in kind of botanical gardens and things, but I'd love to know what it actually looks like and and what's going on when it does its wild thing and grows up a tree as you've described it it's it's the presumably the young shoots are moving towards the dark to get to the tree or whatever it's going to grow up on the ground and then you've got I mean, anyone who's growing this plant um, as a house plant will know about the spaghetti monster of aerial roots that develops. Most climbing aroids, and monster delicioso certainly in this category, produce two sorts of roots. Um, they'll produce a very short or comparatively short clasping root, which will, will hang on to the climbing surface. And then as the plant begins to grow higher, they'll start to produce much longer roots. Now, some of those roots may well indeed travel down the tree trunk and into the ground, and others will sort of hang free in the air and penetrate the ground. But these much longer, um, usually much more robust roots, they are the roots that bring liquids and nutrients to the plant. So they don't have a clasping role. And obviously the, those that grow on the tree trunk will hold the, the thing in place to a certain extent. But the, 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 the job of holding the, the climbing stem to the tree trunk is the job of the clasping roots, and they are sort of short, comparatively short and stubby. So the long, call it the, 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 the long curtains of roots hanging down, they have a different role. And it's important if you're growing these things in pots to make sure those long hanging roots go into the pot. And so because they will then ramify in the pot and produce, you know, the plant will have a lot more availability of nutrients and liquid. Um, than if you just let them hang you know, on the on the bathroom floor. Yeah, that's a, a, that's really interesting. I've seen again a few Instagram hacks where people are putting them in a glass of water, but I imagine it's been much better for them to be going into the the soil in the pot. Yeah, I mean you you can put them into a glass of water, but I mean yeah, they're they're better off in a growing into a into a suitable growing medium, indeed. And some people recommend cutting them off. I mean, if you cut them off, aren't they just going to regrow? Yeah, they're just branch. Well, if you cut them off, you'll get three roots where there was one. <laughs> um, because it's, it's, you know, the root's natural. The natural, you know, the root is basically a very tough structure. So if it gets damaged, and they get damaged in the wild pretty regularly, um, they just branch. So don't cut them off. Put them into the pot. Yeah, I guess that's the idea. Sort of, it, it does. It does make them give them a different look. But I think it's as you say, people have got a slightly wrong image of what these plants actually look. <laughs> Well, look like the, the critical the critical thing about these long we call them feeding roots incidentally the critical thing is that they are the plant's primary source of liquid and nutrients the actual stem in the pot by nature will not last forever if, if, if you go into the forest where there are big populations of big climbers it's very hard to see where the plant originally started growing because the, the stem that originally came out of the ground has long ago deceased and so the plant has re attach yourself to the ground through these long roots and through long whippy stems that have hung down and re-rooted and reclined. So if you constantly don't allow those long roots in cultivation to go into a suitable nutrient, 
uh, suitable soil, the bones of your plant will eventually, once it gets big enough, will, will, will wither and die, because that's what they do. You know, they basically grow up and the bits, the older bits die away. And once that happens, if the plant hasn't got enough roots in the pot, then you're going to lose it, or at least struggle to keep it, keep it happy. Let's talk a little bit about skin dapsis, if we can. I'm, I'm sorry I'm going slightly off, um, off list here, but you're saying lots of interesting things that I want to talk to you about, which is usually what happens in one of my interviews. No swear. Don't worry. Let's talk a little bit about skin dapsis, because this is a, a really fascinating genus. Tell me, tell me about Skindapsus. <laughs> I, I don't I don't have any specific questions. I just I'm just fascinated to know what well, you know. Well, the big thing online at the moment are all these multitudinous colour forms of Skindapsus pictus, platinum and jade, and you know, there's, there's there's dozens of these name ones. And the thing to remember with all of these plants that are being being banded around with these fancy names on, the colour patterning, the, the plants with the colour patterning, are all the juveniles. Once Skindapsus pictus in any manifestation begins to climb and produces adult leaves or semi-adult leaves, the patterning will disappear. I post quite a few times on, on Facebook, in particular one plant that we know quite well in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, an area of forest in central Sarawak, where on the, the, the floor of the, of the forest is covered in a really nice form of pictus with a lovely sort of uh, the scintillating spattered grey and green leaves. But all the adult stages climbing up the trees nearby are plain, dull olive green. And, and I, basically that's the same plant. So a tip for people growing Skindapsus pictus, one is it's all pictus. If you want to call it jade and platinum, that's fine. That helps you identify that colour form for another colour form. It's all pictus. The second thing is you've got to keep it cut. If it starts to produce adult growth, um, it will lose its coloration. Um, Pictus is very widespread in the wild, from southern Thailand right through Sumatra, the whole of the peninsula of Malaysia, whole of Borneo, Java, out into the Philippines. So it's a very widespread species, and as you might expect, it's highly variable. And the color forms are, some of them are spectacular, but it's a transient thing. If you let the plants begin to become adult, you'll lose the color forms. The, the colour will disappear from the leaves. And do we know what benefit that gives the plant being variegated at that juvenile stage? It's probably a it's probably a camouflage thing. There are some studies done in the US, not entirely convincing data, but sort of pointing in the right direction. Not for skin daps, I hasten it, but other groups of plants. Um, it's probably a camouflage thing. The leaves, the leaf colour breaks the leaf outline up. So herbivorous, um, um, pet, uh, herbivorous um, creatures um, perceive the leaf as pre-damaged. And there's, there's some reasonable evidence that this patterning helps the leaves avoid being eaten. Um, the scintillating ones, the one where there's this fraction, like, fraction of light, it might be a way of getting more light into the, into the uh, chloroplast of the leaf. A bit like begonias often have red backs of the leaf, which bounces green light back into the leaf. Um, that's all a bit, all a bit sort of speculative. But it, it, it is interesting that almost none of the climbing aroids with variegated juvenile stages retain that colour into the adult phase. I mean, Monstra dubia doesn't, Skindapsis pictus doesn't, uh, Skindapsis trubii doesn't, uh, Epiphenum amplissimum, uh, sorry, um, Epiphenum amplissimum doesn't. So it's clearly an advantage for the juvenile phase to have a, a patterned leaf. Um, and the anti herbivory thing is, mm, is semi-compelling. Yeah, it does kind of make sense. I guess once they're up in a tree, there's going to be less Ex herbivores exactly. around uh, trying to chew on them. <laughs> which kind well, of, the kind problem of with that story with, the, with rapid offer and skin dust, of course, is the leaves are incredibly unpleasant to eat. They're full yes. of nasty chemicals and they're full of these calcium oxalate crystals, you know, chew on a leaf of monstera, and something you'll regret. It's like eating nettles. But, you know, not all things are affected by, by nettle leaves. So perhaps it's, it, it, it's the best fit we've got at the moment. 
I guess that's what's fascinating is there's, there's always something new to learn, isn't there? And uh, we're still we're still learning. I mean, it's it is really interesting to hear to hear that, and it reminds me of all the fuss about different forms of um, philodendron hederation, which is the same kind of scenario. Yes, indeed. Also, widespread species. Yeah, and a wise, and that seems to be endlessly var- variable in terms of its indeed. appearance as in the juvenile form. Anyway, I, I wonder, right. is it the same? Yes. Is it the same with the adult form that it tends to be? Yeah, they're thin? all green. We we yeah. have we have rain trees on the nursery. These are big legume trees, colossal legume trees, absolutely covered in philodendron uh, micans, which is this one with this sort of coppery juvenile phase. Uh, the, the juvenile leaves are this wonderful sort of burnished, scintillating copper. The adult leaves are cordate and leathery and medium green. <laughs> <laughs> another yes, it, green philodendron yeah yeah that's so that is so interesting but the juvenile is very pretty and i guess in a way this is part of the key to why they're attractive as houseplants in that if it was the other way around absolutely. possibly they wouldn't be uh, absolutely yes indeed <laughs> yeah yeah no you're you're you're, you're bang on the button there yes indeed and they have been for they have been for you know two, a couple of centuries you know the edwardians and the victorians raved about these things um, so it's, it's very true, yes. Can I just finish? And again, this is a question off <laughs> off the sheet, no, but I'm sure with your immense knowledge, you'll be able to handle it. Can you just tell me about one aroid species which listeners will probably never have heard of, but that we should we should know about because they're amazing? Something that you are passionate about Wow, well, that's, we won't know. That's a broad well. Um... <laughs> just pick, a pick at random. Well, no, there's one actually which I, I'm quite excited about. It's, a, it's the thing we just, my wife, Sydney, and I describe. Um, it's a genus called Galantharum. And some of the listeners will have heard of this Galantharum. And Galantharum is a, is a, 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 a small riverside arrow. It grows on, on rocky river banks in, in a fairly remote part of Borneo. And it's, uh, it's got white flowers which hang down like a rather like a Rather like a snowdrop, hence Galanthara, Galanthus, just the snowdrop. And it's got this incredible vanilla perfume. Now, most people associate aroids at best with the smelling of um, less than pleasant things. <laughs> and and um, I'm keeping, I, I saw your note about keeping, keeping this clean. Oh, and, well, and, relatively uh, clean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and others <laughs> you know, are absolutely ranked. I mean, there's no, there's no, there's no doubt about it. Some of the Morphophallus from, from Indochina, the ones with this sort of a liquid propane. Uh, propellant smell are really pretty, pretty, pretty hard work to be in close contact with for too long. But Galatharum kishii, uh, named for a Japanese collector, has got these incredible white flowers, uh, which have got this really nice and, and very powerful vanilla perfume. And this is a plant that I'm very excited about because it was completely unexpected. Um, it was in the middle of one of our doctoral students' work, uh, a, a local Chinese student who's now currently doing a postdoc in Germany. And um, it sort of popped up literally out of nowhere. Um, and it it changed, apart from being a very pretty plant and easy to grow, which is rather nice, it changed our perspective on a, on a genus we've been working on and scratching our heads over, um, a thing called Hotarum, which is also another rather nice aroid. And Hotarum has got these strange blocks of pollen. The pollen looks like it's packed in little white suitcases. And we were completely befuddled as to what on earth this thing was related to, because nothing else has got is pollen in suitcases. Um, and Galantharum suddenly materialised through a, a wild collector. Yeah, this was wild collecting material. And it flowered out and it's got pollen in suitcases. And, it, and then when we did the molecular work, the student did the molecular work, they came out as sister to each other. So it's sort of, it's a lovely plant. Very few people have heard of it. Few people grow it. It smells wonderful. It's got white flowers with a pink tip. Um, it grows easily, and it for us it solved the conundrum. So yeah, that's that would be my choice. Well, I love that description of the pollen. <laughs> that yeah, sounds little amazing. boxes. It's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, as you say, nice to have an aroid that with, with a pleasant scent. So um, I look forward to, to hearing more about that in the future. Do you think it could be something that would be suitable for indoor cultivation in the yeah, West? Yeah, I mean, this is it, it. There are a few people growing it in aquaria, which I, I have a bit of an issue with. And I know I'm going to make enemies by saying this. I have a slight issue with plants which don't grow underwater in the wild being grown in aquaria. But that's what people like to do. So that's fine. But yeah, I, I have a suspicion that. A bit like Bucephalandra, 
it might prove to be easy to tissue culture. Be careful land to prove to be very easy to tissue culture. And there's quite a few of UK now being tissue cultured in Europe, which is good news. And I have a suspicion that Galantara may be in the same category. And it would it's you know it grows about um, 15 centimetres tall, tuft of ready backed dark green leaves on red on red stems and these white nodding flowers held above the foliage. Yeah, I think it's got potential. Yeah. That's exciting. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Peter. It's been fascinating and um, good luck with the society. I'm, I'm looking forward to receive. Well, I've already, I think the newsletter and all the talks and things that are coming up. It sounds tremendously exciting. So thank mm, you very thank much. You. My pleasure. Thanks so much to Peter and do check out the show notes where you'll find all the information you need to find out more about the European Aroid Society and join. And if you do join, there's already a newsletter available for members and a video presentation by Peter about Aroids in the wild. Patreon subscribers, there are two new things popping up on your Patreon feed of An Extra Leaf, the bonus episodes of the show. One of them is an extra slice of interview with last week's guest, Amy March of Perky Plants, where we talk about dealing with the highs and lows of the houseplant social media community. And at some point, I will also drop a bonus interview with Peter Boyce, where we get further into the world of aroids, including conservation, plant poaching and loads more so patreon subscribers look out for those and one or two extra bonuses coming while the patreon is on pause because i'm kind like that and now it's time for question of the week which comes from deborah who wants to pot a handful of cat friendly houseplants in decorative pots without drainage holes and deborah asks other than a bed of rocks on the bottom do you suggest using horticultural charcoal? What would you substitute for the charcoal? Great question, Deborah. I Generally speaking, I advise to always have a drainage hole if you can. But that said, if you've listened to the show for any length of time, you'll know I do have a few plants without drainage holes. The main one I can think of is my Apicia cupriata, member of the Gisneriad clan, which is potted in a square glazed pottery pot and does not have any drainage. It's quite a thirsty plant actually and it's very easy to tell when it needs watering because it does go rather limp and I tend to wait until that moment to water. The other thing I do and I would always recommend if you don't have a drainage hole is calculate precisely, roughly, fairly precisely, how much water it takes to re-wet the potting mix volume in that pot that you're using and only add that much water and then wait until things are pretty dry. So that kind of rules out certain plants that need more steady moisture from this technique because you, yeah, you're otherwise you're going to be landing yourself in trouble if you wait and let them keep drying out to that extent, they're going to be unhappy. So I'm thinking of things like a lot of the ferns, things like phytonias, sometimes tend to collapse if you leave them too long. So think carefully about your plant choices. If you are going to do a pot with no drainage, you do have to think about that bottom layer. Usually that layer will be where the excess water, if there's any excess water that you've put in that doesn't get soaked up by the potting mix, that's where the excess water is gonna go. That's gonna be your kind of water table. And yes, some roots will probably end up growing into that area. And in a way, it's kind of a bit of a, a sort of a wick watered kind of method then because the roots are in there sucking up water as they need them. It does work better for some plants than others. I don't think it really matters what that material is at the bottom of the pot. Normally, I don't recommend putting big chunky crocs and things at the bottom of a drained pot because it actually uh, it's been proven that those actually help that substrate and the rocks to hold on to water rather than improving drainage but seeing as you don't have drainage anyway it doesn't really matter but what it does mean is that the there's that layer which will be mainly rootless 
where that water can sit and the plant can gradually suck up water into the substrate as it needs it, filters out impurities from the soil. This is often described rather poetically as keeping the mixture sweet. The idea is that it absorbs things that are going to make the, the potting mix smell. I don't think this is really true. What it will do is it will absorb water and nutrients and hold on to them until they're required. But I think the two things that activated charcoal are doing are adding extra air to the soil because it's very porous and there are lots of air pockets in it. And also it will take up water and nutrients, which can then be released back as the plant needs them. So those things, I think, are positive. I don't believe all the keeping the potting mix sweet stuff. I just don't think that is. I don't quite understand the science behind that. And I've never seen any evidence that that actually works. I'll link to a good post from Laidback Gardener about using activated charcoal in terrariums, which kind of makes the same points that I've made really about why they don't, why it's not necessary for terrariums. So yeah, anything that you want at the bottom there that's chunky and porous. So it could be charcoal. It could be expanded clay pebbles. If you put just stones or grit, they will hold moisture between them, but not within themselves. So if you can go for something that's porous, that is worthwhile trying. But the main thing with potting without a drainage hole is just being super careful with the watering, especially at times when the plant is not in active growth. you got to keep a real hawk eye on those plants. And particularly if you're putting more than one plant in the pot, make sure the plant's needs are all the same roughly in terms of watering, because then you won't have one plant that's really fed up because it keeps getting stressed through lack of water when the other ones are fine. Inevitably, in any mixed planting setup, one plant will outcompete the others. That always just happens. So be prepared to keep an eye out for that and change things as necessary. But yes, no drainage holes can work. It just requires choosing the right plants and keeping an eye on water quantities and and don't worry too much about that layer at the bottom provided you've got those other things covered i hope that helps deborah and i'll be back in september answering more of your questions and do stay in touch i do love all your emails messages text and tips a couple more that i wanted to share with you before i go Starting with this awesome tip from Jody, who got in touch about ways to detect when Curio rolianus needs watering. And this involves the epidermal windows in the globular leaves of this plant. So those are the dark stripes that you see across each of those pea-like leaves. And these allow light to go into the centre of the leaf to photosynthesise. So Jody recommends that when the substrate is dry, the epidermal windows will close or become very thin and that's when it's safe to water. So that's a great tip. I hadn't thought of that, but that's absolutely right. Thank you for sharing, Jody. And finally, Lydia got in touch about an underrated houseplant, Calicia fragrance, the basket plant, and is wondering why it's not more widely available. I don't know, Lydia. You're absolutely right. It's a really great plant and we should all be growing it. I think it's one of those ones that gets handed around between friends and family. But yes, Calicia fragrance, the basket plant, kind of bomb proof and a great plant. So let's see more of that around, please. That is all for this week's show. I hope that the next few weeks pass painlessly for you all. I will be cracking on with writing Legends of the Leaf and there's still plenty of time to support the book. I need to reach my stretch goal of 115% to unlock a new reward level, which is a really good one. It's going to involve a 25 pack of postcards featuring each of the... 25 
plant illustrations done by the wonderful illustrator Helen Entwistle for the book. So that's a really good goal. If we can get to 115%, I'll be delighted. We're currently at 109%, and I'll keep you updated as to how the book's going and any voucher offers or so on as they come up via the usual social media platforms and just a huge thank you to all the people the hundreds of people who've supported the book it's been really heartwarming and i'm now on a mission to make this the best most kick-ass houseplant book out there so i cannot wait to get this to you but i'm gonna have to make you wait a little bit longer because i've got to finish writing the thing first right that's it enough from me for the moment Go and join the European Aroid Society and I will see you same day, same pod channel in September. Love to you all. Bye. The music you heard in this episode was Roll Jordan Roll by the Joy Drops. The Road We Used to Travel When We Were Young by Komiku and After the Flames by Josh Woodward. The ad music was Whistling Rufus by the Heftone Banjo Orchestra. All tracks are licensed under Creative Commons. See the show notes for details.